Uh, let's see, uh, the clicker. This is the, the beginning of everything. So uh, let me, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about AI and in particular about what's called deep reinforcement learning, which is kind of a frontier technology. Of course, there's an infinite number of frontier technologies these days. There's so many exciting things going on. And I, of course, can't talk about all of them. I can't even follow all of them. But I'm going to talk about something that's close to my work and that I think is very important in understanding some of the emerging features of AI technology that are going to be important in the next few years. So what am I going to do in this talk? I'm going to quickly talk about this technology called deep learning. I don't know exactly you know, how many people in the audience know what deep learning is. Some, but not everybody. OK, that's good. That's good. That means that there'll be something for everyone. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about supervised learning versus what's called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a, a problem in computer science. It's been around for a long time. By itself, it has nothing to do with deep learning. And I'll tell you what it is and how it works. And this new technology called deep reinforcement learning is really an application of deep learning to solving the long-standing problem of reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is what gives a lot of these new algorithms the appearance of, well, artificial intelligence. Then I'll talk a little bit about what this technology is doing right now, you know, what people have done in the last few years up till now, and then a little bit about what maybe we can expect from it coming in the future. So we'll start out by just kind of understand what this topic is. What is deep reinforcement learning, this thing that I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you about today? So let me tell you a little bit about deep learning first before I get into deep reinforcement learning. So if you take a look at this plot, this is like everything you could possibly want to know about everything on one big plot. But let me kind of draw your eye to a couple of things. At the top is artificial intelligence research going back, you know, to the 40s, right? And artificial neurons, the Turing test, things like to simulate early, early work. And people thought back in the 40s that, you know, we were almost there, you know. <laughs> we, we simulate these neurons on the computer, we have a bunch of neurons, and bingo, we're going to have artificial intelligence. Well, it turned out that didn't really work out. Uh, it was a long, long time before anything really uh, exciting of the scale that we see today began to happen. And one of the things I want to draw your, draw your eye to is if you look at the bottom, the internet, the internet is something that you don't think of as being an AI technology, but it turns out to have been very important in enabling it. And in the early days of the internet, you know, the ARPANET was born in 1970. Packet switching was invented in 1965. This is the early, early days. That blue chart is showing us how many machines there are on the internet. You know, it hasn't really picked up until about 1995, and there's Google and so on. And then it becomes very important. What's really interesting here is that Deep neural networks, what they represent is the ability to essentially simulate a very large, complex function on a computer, which is inspired by how biological neural networks work. And this simulation is able to ingest a great deal of data and figure out essentially what's important about it, what's important to make decisions from it. And with that data, then we can produce, teach the system to generalize and produce answers in the future. But the problem, the reason that deep learning took s until now to appear is really the issue that data sets weren't big enough. You know, it was very hard to get enough data. So it, it just in, I, I put in the middle here, there's some like uh, AI related movies and such just to keep you oriented. But you can see that, that these technologies, all this deep learning, what's called AlexNet, these things I'm going to talk about today, these things all happen after the sort of explosion and the boom of the internet. And that will turn out to be very important. So to give you an idea of just why this happened, in the, in the 80s, you know, I, people I knew who were working in AI research back in those days, in fact, that, that computer there is a, is a thinking machine CM2. A friend of mine built that. And uh, if you look at what's going on in those days, like if you wanted a bunch of images of things, you had to have somebody go and take a photo, right? And then you sort of collected a bunch of photos, and then you used your computer to try to train your network. And it was hard. It was hard to get a big data set. You know, if you wanted 100 pictures of cats, you had to, like, get a camera and go visit your friend's house and photograph cats. You know, it wasn't that easy in those days. But what's happened in the modern era is, you know, mobile technology has made pho photography utterly ubiquitous. The internet, now it's easy to get data sets with millions of images. Just Google search anything you want and you'll get countless images of it. This, you know, th compute power has grown tremendously. The power of that cube is, is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the power of a modern graphics card. So the use of GPUs and modern technology has helped tremendously. And so instead of getting, you know, zero, <laughs> which is what we got from not enough data and not enough compute, we got tons of data, tons of compute, and a lot of these algorithms just basically started working, okay? They started working for the first time.
So this is what typical data, this is, you know, in the simplest form, this is the kind of thing that the early, like, defense DARPA research projects that funded all this AI stuff back in the 60s and 70s, they, they wanted to be able to look at an image and say, hey, that's got an elephant in it, that's a warship, that's a pumpkin. This, this is what everybody was interested in. And this led to, uh, even in the modern era, a lot of the early successes with deep neural networks were based on what we call supervised learning. So in supervised learning, I have a lot of case examples, and I have, you know, here's a whole bunch of flowers, and I show this neural network, here's a picture of a flower, it's a flower. Here's another picture, it's also a flower. Here's a picture, it's a pumpkin. One by one, I expose the network to these many things, and what neural networks are very, very good at doing is taking a large amount of, of these kind of connections and sort of sorting out the, the correct features in the input data that you need to, f to make a determination of the output. And for a long, long time before there were these complex deep neural networks, it was very, people had to come up with sort of in their head, they had to think of a, like what they call features, and they had to think about how would you do this sort of for every problem each time. They had to come up with some tricky way of telling, say, elephants from dogs or whatever. And the neural network does this automatically by just being presented huge numbers of examples, and that's, that's its charm. Okay? Now, that phenomenon we call supervised learning because there's somebody, you know, usually the programmer, sort of providing these pairs. This is an input, and it goes with this output one by one. And on this to the tune of millions and millions of examples, which we can do in the Internet era. Now, I want to talk about something a little bit different than supervised learning, what we call reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a situation, uh, uh, let me give you an example problem that's like a typical reinforcement learning problem. In a typical reinforcement learning problem, let's say you go to the uh, casino and there's a bunch of uh, slot machines. And some slot machines are kind of more friendly than others, you know, like some give better rewards than others, you know, some you never win, some you win rarely, some give big payouts, some give small payouts. And you want to figure out, like, what's the best strategy? What do I do? You know, which slot machine do I play? But in the beginning, you don't know anything about these slot machines. So you play one for a while, and then if it looks like it's kind of a good one, you might play it more. If it's kind of a bad one, you might try another one. And you might think about how do you actually optimize that? That's a, it's actually a famous computer science problem that some of you have probably encountered at some point called the many-armed bandit problem, referential to the phrase one-armed bandit to refer to a slot machine. And in this kind of problem, you might ask, well, what's the best way to do it? How do you figure out, you know, what's the best thing? Now, this problem called reinforcement learning is kind of the computer science formalized version of how do you solve problems like that. How do you start out with what's called a, a policy, a, a rule for how to, how to proceed, and then do some experiments and improve the rule as you learn about what the world is like, because remember I said you don't get to know how those slot machines work, you experiment, and of course when you do an experiment, you learn a little bit, and that changes your policy, and then change your policy, you change what you do, and, and you kind of iterate along. So, you know, this is my example here that I stole from a totally awesome web page called Cyber Rodent Project. But uh, this, you know, this rat is, is trying to figure out how to navigate the maze. And he tries a certain kind of set of rules. And if he's successful, he gets the cheese, and he says, those are good rules. And if he's not successful, he says, well, that's a bad rule. Let's try to find a better one. Here's a little bit more complicated example, but a little closer to home for me. It involves coffee pots. But this is, a, this is a little bit the formal terminology which I'll use as we progress in the talk. Uh, we'll talk about what are called policies and what are called value functions. These are the things you want to learn. Now you, uh, you, you can see this is a little different than learning to categorize flowers from elephants, right? In, we're not talking about deep learning for the moment, but then I'll bring the two together. So in reinforcement learning, you know, you have some set of rules. This is like what to do when you encounter the coffee pot at work. Is it full? Is it empty? If it's full, you take some coffee. If it's empty, you take some coffee. And then, you know, if you make more coffee, then everybody likes you. And if you take the last coffee, then people don't like you and so on. And, and that's, that's what's called the value function. This is sort of what happens. This is your reward for behaving in a certain way. And if you, if you leave the pot full but the switch is off, then people get upset because the coffee gets cold. But they're not too mad. 
the best case is that it's full and the switch is on, the coffee is hot. And of course, the worst case is that it's empty and the switch is on, right? And it's like burning up and it's terrible and smells bad. So, you know, you, you, you evolve a policy that looks like this is how I'm going to deal with this at work. What, what do I do in the various cases, right? But in, in the beginning, you may not be much of a coffee drinker. Maybe you just joined a new company. It's a very coffee-centric company. And everybody's got opinions. You have to kind of learn what's good and what's bad, right? And so what actually happens in practice, you're not given the value function or the policy, and you don't know, you can't just solve the policy because you don't know the value function. You can't solve the value function if you don't know the policy. So you kind of go back and forth, right? You experiment with the policy. If the policy is bad and people get mad at you, then you've learned why they got mad, you know, something about the value function, and then you adjust your policy and go around and so on. This is a very classic problem in behavioral science and computer science, and people have been working on this problem for decades. The reason this problem has been so hard, it, it's it, a lot of really wonderful sort of mathematician style work has been done on problems that are relatively simple, that, that are kind of easy to understand. But what if you have a very complicated, like in a real world problem, you have, you know, I don't know, you're trying to develop some control policy to keep your nuclear reactor from melting down and there's hundreds of inputs that are pressures and temperatures all over the place, right? And then your system has to kind of learn what to do as a result of each of those cases to keep the reactor from blowing up, not to mention it's expensive to do, you know, failed experiments. These, how to deal with complicated real world situations is very hard, partially because it may be very hard to even express this model of, of how, you know, when your robot is reaching to grab something and the hand is in a certain place relative to what you're grabbing, what do you do next? It's never even going to happen twice. Right? And that's never going to be exactly the same twice. So you need some way to in extrapolate or rather interpolate from your experiences. That's where sort of deep learning comes in. Because deep learning, remember I told you, these deep neural networks are very good at modeling complex functions. So if you have this very complex function, like, you know, based on where your robot is, what's it going to do, you know, how's it going to, or you want to drive a car, right? Do you turn the steering wheel right or left, press the gas or the brake in response to the image you see out in front of you, which is very complex, right? Cars everywhere, people running around, even more complex here in India than it is in the United States. So, you know, the rules are a little stricter, I think. So, how do, you, how do you deal with that? That's something the deep network is very, very good at. So a really seminal event. In, in 2015, um, the DeepMind, which was later acquired by Google, did this extraordinary experiment where they, they played these old console video games from like the Atari 2600, right? I don't know. Well, some of half of us are probably old enough to remember this. But you know, it learned to play these games. And what it did is it, it just looked at the pixels. It wasn't told anything. It just it had, it had eight outputs. It could move the joystick any direction, or it could move the joystick some direction and press the you know red button. And it didn't know anything. It wasn't told about bullets or, or, or aliens or whatever. And all it did was just experiment and try to maximize its score. And this is so important because it learned this convolutional neural network, which is the particular kind that it learned, learned to represent the image on the screen and figure out what was important. And from that, take the correct actions. And this is the kind of thing that to us humans starts to look like intelligence, right? It's experimenting and it's learning. It's very different when, if I'm gonna present, you know, a bunch of flowers and the word flower and a bunch of cows and the word cow, you know, maybe it sort of learns to do that, but that doesn't strike most of us as learning. That's more like, you know, kind of just parameter optimization. But here it starts to look, you know, eerily like what we associate with people doing. It's experimenting, and it gets good at things. So let me talk a little bit about what's happening today. So actually, I'm going to take a moment and show you from the paper I just described with the Atari. Uh, could we play the video that's attached to this or loosely related to it? So this algorithm called deep Q learning, uh, that's technical stuff for the nerds, but that's me. <laughs> but the, the, the algorithm that's going to start out, it's going to just flop around. It doesn't really know what to do. It doesn't even know what the joystick means. And, and so it plays for a while, and you, and you can see it does very badly. You know, the little ball just bounces down, and the little paddle thing just flops around, and it, it, it's really kind of sad. But this is just the very beginning, because it doesn't know anything. But every once in a while, you, it hits the ball back, and it gets a point or something. It says, ah, whatever I did was good. After a certain amount of training, it turns out only two hours on a very fast computer, the, the thing's getting pretty good, right? It's sort of learned that, you know, whatever it is that hits the ball back is, is good. It's, so, it's sort of at some level internalized that there is a ball and there is a paddle. I mean, not in some semantic way, but somehow it, it is able to distinguish these different cases. And it plays the game pretty well. 
and it finally starts to really learn things that are quite subtle, right? And so after a couple hours, now four hours of training, it's actually learned not just to hit the ball, but it, it's kind of learned certain strategies are very optimal. And so, you know, for those of you who are old enough to remember this game pong, remember that the way you really win is you do this. You get the ball, like up, you drill a, to a tunnel and you shoot the ball up through that tunnel. So that's a, that's a, that was a tremendous achievement. Now, something that's not as obvious from that, which is equally, if not more important, is that this algorithm was not, it was trained on each of like, I don't know, a hundred video games. But the algorithm itself was in no way tailored to any one specific game. The only difference between the hundred or so games was that it played the hundred or so different games and learned from playing that game. This is absolutely huge, right? People could have written programs to play Pong, you know, decades ago, right? But an algorithm that learns to play Pong and the same algorithm can learn to play Space Invaders and, you know, whatever all those old games were, that was the thing that really woke everybody up. And they said, wow, something really significant is going on. So, was there a video in between? This one isn't a video because here, we're gonna talk a little bit about AlphaGo. Right, so chess games were very easy to beat. Chess is not a very complicated game, and it was a long time ago that you could write computer programs that did quite well at chess. And probably only two or three people in this room could have beat the chess programs of like the 1970s. Now, if you're a world-class chess player, if you're Garry Kasparov, it took another couple of decades. But the truth is, good chess games aren't hard to program because chess is just not that complex a game. And in any given board, there's not that many different boards, and there's not that many moves that are anyone's ever going to take in a particular board. This is not the case with Go, right? There are enormous numbers of moves possible, right? The number of possible boards exceeds the number of atoms in the universe, right? And this game cannot be played by just tabulating all the cases. You have to learn, you know, what Go players call Aji. You have to learn an intuition for the board. You have to look at it and say, yeah, this board's pretty good, but it'd be better if I put a white thing over here. And that's not an easy thing to teach a computer. And the computer programs that play Go are as old as computer programs that play chess, but the good ones never existed. You, if you learn to play Go, you could, within a month, you could beat every Go playing computer game until very recently. So for that reason, AI researchers held up Go as an example of something that was very challenging for computers, something that would really take a long time before it was solved. So Google comes along and creates AlphaGo. Well, what does AlphaGo do? It starts out with actually a little bit of supervised learning, like uh, 30 or 50,000 games, I've forgotten the exact number, that are, that are just known, like, you know, uh, available games of great masters and whatever play that it could study to learn some real basics on top of the rudimentary rules. And then from there, it just played itself. And it got better and better and better, right? And it learned this kind of, use this neural networks to represent the board in an abstract way, and it learned the correct abstractions that were effective for winning, right? And so in 2016, this is Lee Sudol, this, uh, I, you know, I joke that this is also a video because Lee Sudol is sitting there like for a long time staring at the board, right? And, and, you know, he was realizing like, wow, you know, I could lose this, right? Like he did not think he was going to lose this computer, right? And the, the computer had reached the point where it could win against master players. Now this, act, the, you know, the story continued, it went on, grew, they improved it. More recently, I'll talk about this in a second, but the, the most recent iteration of AlphaGo, called AlphaGo Zero, is even more advanced. It didn't learn from any of those ancient games, any of those recorded games. It was only told the rules, and all it did was play against itself, essentially. And it got better and better and better. And at a certain point, it could beat every version that had ever competed against any of the masters. And now, master Go players look to AlphaGo Zero as a teacher. AlphaGo Zero is providing new games with new strategies that no one has ever seen before and the great master players are studying AlphaGo Zero's games to understand new dimensions to the game that they had never seen. So, oh look, this video actually played. <laughs> who, saw, who, saw, who thought that would come? This is an example in robotics. So in robotics, this is a Google experiment, and the fellow you'll see in the back, his name is Sergey Levine, he was, uh, he's at UC Berkeley actually, um, what they did is they took a bunch of robots, essentially identical ones, and tried to teach them how to pick stuff up. Now again, like all these other situations, and you can see there's little cameras on, uh, I have a laser pointer that I can zap. You see these little cameras here? Those cameras are looking down at the stuff in the box. Trays are full of all kinds of stuff, like, uh, you know, like little toys and erasers and whatever kind of junk you find lying around Google. Swedish fish, you know. And, uh, 
And, and they just set this thing to try to grab stuff. And in the beginning, you know, just like the Pong game, it couldn't do anything. It just flopped around and didn't achieve anything. But every once in a while, you know, it would randomly succeed at grasping something. It would say, hmm, that was, that was useful. Whatever I just did, that was important. Let's do more of that. And, and over the course of many, many hours, it could learn more and more. Now, another thing about that video, unfortunately, see, there used to be a, a still that would sit there, but well, maybe I can get it to come back. Probably regret this. Well, I'll just let it play again. So they have many, many of these robots. This is a very important thing, right? Because each robot has a different experience. But unlike you and me, you know, if we go out and we decide, hey, let's go learn how to, I don't know, juggle. Well, I might learn a little, and you might learn a little, and you might learn a little. But each of us is on our own little story, right? It's different with the robots, right? There, there's 14, I think, in this room. And every one of them, they get together at night and share everything they learned all day. Right? So they update the algorithm on a nightly basis with all the experiences of all the robots. That's a huge thing. That's why self-driving cars will someday be much safer than human drivers. Like that's why so many different things in robotics and AI and machine learning will exceed human capacity. Not because robots are sort of better by nature, but because all of the robots are one. Right? <coughs> Very philosophical. <coughs> So I'll show you something that sort of give you a sense of what's coming in the future. There's supposed to be a timer here that's running, but I have no idea how much time I've used. So here, the, this is another deep mind experiment. Now, training a machine, a robot that could walk, is very hard because robots that can walk are rare and expensive. So instead, they're using a simulated environment. But what's happening here is there's a policy. The robot is kind of, you know, it, it, there isn't really a physical robot, but there's a program that sort of drives this simulated robot, you know, what to do with your legs, how to move, jump, thrust with the feet, and so on. And it's just experiments. And all it was told is get to the right. Just get to the right. If the farther you get, the more points you get, right? The more happy you get. For us, it's dopamine or something. For the robot, it's just, you know, points. But the robot, you can see it does all this weird stuff, but slowly, as it screws around, it learns all these different policies. And this is a, a robot of a slightly different design, you know, like a little four-legged walker. And it's learning, you know, case by case. By the way, the long version of this video is hilarious. If you look at it up on the, on the YouTubes, you'll see like all, that, all the failed and the people falling and whatever. But it, they, it, they keep giving it more and more complex tasks and it gets better and better and better, right? So this is actually a little bit of a window to help us, I think, understand where this technology is, is leading. First of all, reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning, they're not specific to robotics, but you can see how they can have a huge impact in robotics. Learning control policies, just like you and I, when we were little, we couldn't walk. We had to learn how to do that through experimentation. We got better and better. Some of us are now parkour masters. Not me, but I mean, maybe someone out there. Uh, you know, but people are athletes and they can do extraordinary things, which, you know, as little children, they never imagined that they would be capable of doing. And that's from practice and experimentation and slowly, you know, your own non-artificial neural network learn to control all of your muscles and operate your body. Here you can see it builds like strange policies that sort of worked and then, oh, maybe not. And, you know, it, it has all these intermediate states. And as I said, some are quite hilarious. And, and this was one that seemed to be working for a while, but ultimately was outperformed by, you know, one that was more natural to us. And then they would give it these challenging worlds where things could fall away and things like that, so that, you know, each, each iteration in its learning experience got more and more challenging, so it became more and more capable. Um, the, the use of deep reinforcement learning can be applied to any kind of, you might call an agent, any kind of software. Some software that's deep reinforcement learning will control robots, and it will use the robot's perceptions to control what that robot is doing. Other, other things will train other kinds of agents, whether they're chatbots or whether they're uh, medical devices, right? So you can train a robot to do, uh, you know, a surgery, right? Uh, somebody uh, much smarter than me was talking a little while ago about healthcare, and in, in the case of improving healthcare, you know, robotics can play an enormous role in healthcare. Now we use a little bit robotics in telemedicine, uh, things like the da Vinci surgical machine, but in time, the da Vinci surgical machine will learn to do the operation without the doctor. Right? They're just going to record what all the doctors do <laughs> and then use that to train the machine to just do it on its own. So this, is, uh, this video goes on for a while. I don't know, somehow we got the long version. But uh, the, 
the thing I want to kind of lead everybody to, this is, yeah, that's the end of that video. So this is kind of the wrap up. It's like, what, what should we be thinking about? What, what you should think about is now we are able to produce a class of algorithms that learn by experimentation. And as I was saying, this have a lot of effect in robotics, but it will appear in many other places. So you should expect to see these kind of robotic agents out in the world and experimenting. Some of them are entirely digital. Some of them may appear to you as friends on Facebook who are not actually human. Others may come to you in other forms. But what we are beginning to see is these learning algorithms that can composite experience, their own and that of all of their copies, to learn to solve very complex problems that have anything in the domain of control and interaction. So that's it. That's, uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. This was so amazing. Uh, <clears throat> I think we break for uh, we break for tea now for like half an hour. But uh, in case uh, one of one of you to I mean one of you guys have any questions, I think we can uh, you know we can take one last uh, one last question or one question. Do you have do you, any of you guys have a question? Yes, please. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. In, in in what context? See, I want to know more about applications of uh, reinforcement learning. See, there have been applications in games and uh, some other uh, simple, uh, are, I mean, uh, mostly experimental environments or research environments. But other than that, what are the real world applications that you can see? Huh. Sure. So reinforcement learning is, is very good for learning complex control policies. Complex control policies, as I mentioned a moment ago, they can appear in sort of non-robotic contexts, uh, such as uh, let's say you have an agent that's a chatbot and it's interacting with folks on the internet trying to successfully, let's say, sell them a product. So they, you know, they, they go to the chatbot, they, they, they're calling Dell or something and they say, hey, my computer's broken. And the chatbot is learning to upsell them things like you often train people in, in call centers to do. And, and if the chatbot can successfully sell them, you know, a new monitor or something, then, you know, it gets, it gets reward points, right? So you can see that there's lots of situations in which you have kind of a complex way of interacting with the world, or in this case with the, with the customer, right? And you want to explore and find the good strategies for interacting with them. So, that, so you can see that this happened in, in an uh, interactive context whether it's between humans and machines. It can happen between machines and machines. There's some fascinating stories about um, Google and Facebook and others that have done experiments to try to automate some of the negotiation policies that are used to price ads and things like that. So there's a large number of these interactive situations. As I said, sometimes human to machine, sometimes machine to machine, sometimes machine to world in the sense of like a robot interacting or walking. Now you see a lot on the internet, a lot of, um, uh, simulated environments, right? And, and that's a result of several things. One, academians tend not to have a great deal of money, right? So Google can buy 14 robots, but a professor at University X may just have to simulate 14 robots. Uh, even they may not have enough money to simulate 14 robots, because even simulating costs money. Maybe they can simulate four robots. Uh, but also, you know, there's a, a destructive nature to failure with many devices, right? So many Silicon Valley companies that are doing various forms of uh, autonomous driving, one of the cornerstones of their system is to develop a simulated environment that's high fidelity and high quality that they can use to, you know, drive around in auto autonomously, right, and crash a lot. Right, so that they can learn not to crash because, you know, in the Pong game, when the ball goes through, nobody dies. But in a car, you know, that's not great. So simulation plays a very important role both in the emerging of the algorithms in an academic environment, but also to actually develop the algorithms when the system being controlled might be damaged or destroyed by incorrect operation. Then it's very important to be able to use this kind of simulation. Does that help? So, so there's a wide range of different contexts of interaction that you'll see these things in. You can use them for arbitrarily complex problems. You know, uh, if your goal is to, you know, uh, sort of manipulate a system, you want to bring about, you know, I mean, there's there's adversarial cases like strange election results through posts on social media, things like that. These are all things that can be explored by these kind of algorithms that can learn optimal policies for getting particular responses. 
You can optimize email exchanges. You know, if you send some unsolicited mail to somebody, you'd like them to respond and, and respond in a positive manner. That's a very challenging task, right? Because most people don't like unsolicited mail. They call it spam, right? But if you can create unsolicited mail that is engaging and interesting that people are willing to respond to, particularly in a positive mood, uh, then you've done something very important. So that's another example where people are trying to do policy evolution for the generation of communication outreach programs to get the maximal results. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Adrian. I think this was a very, very inspiring and uh, kind of mind-opening session, right? So I have one last uh, you know, question sure. for you before we, we close, which is um, what is AI, what do all these uh, you know, recursive learning experiments actually teach us about you know, and what makes us human? What is it, what, is, what do we mean by human? Because at the end of the day, it's about, you know, our way of perspective and our way of solving problems, right? And looks like the machines are doing that now. So what makes us human? What, what, what can we learn from these experiments? This isn't one of the softball questions. <laughs> uh, so, well, that's a fascinating question and probably a topic for an entire talk. Uh, or a great movie, like for those who've seen the new Blade Runner movie, it's a lot about exploring this question, right? We have certain things that we think we're really good at. For a long time, people said, oh, you know, uh, computers will learn to do, like, boring, simple stuff, but humans, the domain of art and creativity will be, will be ours. But a little brief literature search, and you'll find that computers are, 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 you know, these kind of algorithms are producing, you know, pop songs and classical music and new Picasso paintings and just like all kinds of stuff. It's actually a little upsetting, right? Because a human, we thought, well, that isn't that, it wasn't that our part, but it turns out the computers are actually quite good at that. Uh, you know, we have to think a little bit about these things. What does make us human? I think if I were to allow myself a, a little intellectual flexibility on this, the Turing test, which is a very famous piece of artificial intelligence history, Alan Turing was asked, you know, well, how do you decide that a robot is, you know, artificially intelligent? And he said, well, you know, if you kind of put it behind a curtain and people interact with it and they can't tell that it's a robot, you know, then it's artificially intelligent. That seems pretty good, but actually, you know, it leads to kind of a flip side, which is that, you know, if you put kind of an unusually dull person behind a curtain and you talk to them, you might think they're a robot for sure, <laughs> right? And, and, and so, in a way, it kind of drives us, you know? The, the, the machines are being able to do some of the things that we do, and it should make us, it should make us wonder, perhaps, but also try to, try to pursue those elements of our humanity that are not easily caught up by machines. And I think most of us would agree that those are some of the most pleasant things. So I think when I look at this kind of robotic future and the AI future, I see a lot of the, the dullness of our lives being passed on to, the, to these robotic agents and us focusing our minds and our attention on finding the things that make us the most human and enjoying them. Thanks, Adrian. I'm happy to talk to Thank folks you. after the talk. <laughs>